Okay, so what we're going to talk about for about the next hour is the history of digital change in the, in the U.S. market, particularly focused on book publishing, although distinctions between media are going to be increasingly meaningless. Um, and I want, I, I picked this not because I'm an American or an English speaker, but because the U.S. did lead the way. And it didn't lead the way because there's anything particularly special about the United States, except that we have 300 million people with one government, one commercial system, one currency, and pretty much one language. So that cre we created a, a, a pool of, uh, of people to work with and institutions to work with that were also benefited by the fact that we have a fairly laissez-faire attitude in the United States toward business, and particularly in the internet benefited from that. And, and there was a, an ethic that we should let the internet develop without government interference. So there was a, a, uh, a great test tube with an attitude that, in a, a, that permitted experimentation. But there is a bit of prehistory. If digital change really, as we understand it, starts in the 1990s, this is uh, something that happened in the 70s that suggests what the computer could do. Before the 1970s, the US book publishing world looked very much like Spain's today. We had a lot of publishers, and we had a lot of booksellers. And most of the traffic was directly between the publishers and the booksellers. So what that meant was that the orders were small, each order was small, and, um, and that the, the, av the availability of books was very, very erratic. Some publishers delivered very quickly, some publishers didn't. Bookstores just had to live with the fact that um, they would, some books they would get fast, some books they wouldn't, and it made it very hard to stock a store. And there wasn't really wholesaling. And by wholesaling I mean a business that buys the books from the publishers, puts them in a warehouse, and makes them available for stores to order. And the advantage to a store of a wholesaler is that they can buy books of many publishers in one place. So at the end of a day, when a, whole, when a bookseller had sold 200 books in a prop that came from 34 different publishers, he didn't have to write 34 orders to replace those books. He could write one order to a wholesaler. But the problem was it was a terrible business because there were hundreds of thousands, a couple hundred thousand titles that were possible. Nobody could stock them all. Stores would run out of different ones all the time. Um, and so what happened, well, there, were, there were two kinds of wholesalers then. There were library wholesalers, and they operated because the libraries didn't care how long it took to get the book. So the libraries would order from the wholesaler, the wholesaler would order from the publisher, and whenever the book came in, the library would accept it. And the other kind of wholesalers were what we called mass market independent distributors. They didn't have any stock either because they bought magazines and mass market books and they just put them out into racks in department stores, in drug stores, in places that did not want to, like a bookstore, order everything themselves. So what would happen is that a publisher would put out a book in a first printing and it would take off. And suddenly, lots of stores needed that book. So the local library wholesaler or mass market ID would bring in a, a pallet, a, sh a, a truckload of those books and get them to the stores. But this was very few of the titles that were in generally available. So what that meant was that stores that tried to use wholesalers found that most of the time the order couldn't be filled. And most of the orders that the wholesaler got were, em were not commercially useful to them. So they would get an order for 100 books, they had 10, they had to reject the order for 90, and it was just wasted time and effort for everybody. Ingram, in the early 1970s, was a small 
local wholesaler in Tennessee that had come out of the Tennessee School Book Depository. And the School Book Depositories were created because the textbook publishers didn't want to bother with small schools. So they would sell the books to all the big school districts, but the small schools had a hard time getting the books. So, the, so various states said, if we're going to approve this textbook for use in our schools, you have to put copies in our depository so that any school in the state can get them. So the Ingram family bought the Tennessee Book Company, which was the Tennessee School Book Depository, and in the early 70s was trying to turn it into a wholesaler for bookstores. But they had the same problem that everybody else did which was that most of the orders they got, they couldn't fill. One day, the guy who was running Ingram, a man named Harry Hoffman, had come from Bell & Howell. And Bell & Howell was a hardware company, and they had developed a microfiche reader. And the beauty of the microfiche was that on a piece of film about this size, you could get an enormous amount of information, which you put on the microfiche reader, and it, it projected it, so it made it large enough to read. And they figured out that they could put their whole inventory on a microfiche and distribute it once a week, and the stores would know which books they had. And they would order the books they had and wouldn't place orders to Ingram for the books they didn't have. So this could be a huge commercial advantage, and, but the problem was, the readers themselves were expensive. And Ingram couldn't afford to just put readers into thousands of stores. So you had to persuade the stores to rent the reader so that they could then get the microfiche. And the readers cost $10 a month. So the big question was, could Ingram persuade enough stores to spend $10 a month on this new piece of hardware so that they could mail them a micro, that's what they did, US mail, a microfiche once a week, mail it out on Saturday, would arrive at the store on Monday, and the store would know what Ingram's inventory was at that moment. Well, the stores loved the idea. And so very quickly, Ingram went from a 10% or 15% fill rate to a 90% fill rate. And you don't have to be an economics major or have an MBA to understand that that is going to be extremely powerful in the economics. And it was. And it enabled them to keep building their inventory to more and more titles because they would get the orders because the stores knew they had it. Very quickly, this changed the nature of the U.S. book distribution system, and suddenly large independent stores started to grow because the cost of acquiring the inventory plummeted, and the ability to carry one or two copies and restock quickly became something that everybody could do. And in the 10 years after Ingram created the microfiche, the number of independent, large, superstore, independent stores, mushroomed. So that was a sort of an outlier, right? Where digital change really begins is when consumers start to use, consume digital content. And in the United States, that started with closed systems, the three biggest ones being Prodigy, CompuServe, and America Online, AOL. And the way those worked was that they were dial-ups, essentially, to a central switchboard that had the content in an enclosed environment. And people started to use it, and people started to get comfortable with content in their computers and using email as such it was within those systems. And gradually, in the, 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 the consumer got access to the whole internet. And by the mid to late 1990s, the web really begins in 93, 94, 95. By the late 1990s, it became obvious that the web would substitute for all of these things. 
and the closed platforms became irrelevant. So that was the point at which it really was possible to reach anybody and reach everybody from any single point. Now, in the beginning, before there was a web, there were, essentially, there was a PC world and a Mac world. And this was before Windows. So the PC world was a sort of an all text and code world. And the Mac world had the graphical user interface that we're all familiar with now. And the, graphical, and the Macs could do so much more than the PCs in terms of delivering content in various forms. So the experimentation tended to take place in Macs. And the first breakthrough was the Voyager Expanded Book, which was created about 1990 or 91. And it looks very much like you would imagine something would today. It had books with pages that you actually turned. You pushed a button and they turn. And hyperlinks to all sorts of content, and video and audio, et cetera. But the problem was, there were only 10% of the people had apples. So the market was really limited. And so the, and the cost of creating a Voyager expanded book was not trivial. So it was wonderful stuff and very interesting, but not commercially viable. The other thing that was happening was that the people who were thinking about content in digital forms weren't thinking so much about audiences as they were thinking about technological capabilities. And there was a certain interest in doing it if it could be done. And not thinking, thinking through what, how people would use it, why people would use it, what people would use it for. At the same time, we moved from diskettes to CD-ROMs. The reason that happened was because of Windows. When Microsoft made Windows, it took 20 diskettes to install it into a computer. That's a lot of physical cost. That's a lot of money involved in 20 diskettes. One CD-ROM could put it into the computer. So Microsoft's cost of goods would plummet. So Microsoft, with the power that they had, persuaded all the computer manufacturers that they had to have CD-ROM drives in the computers, and they started to be built in. So a whole industry grew up of people who wanted to make content for CD-ROMs. But you cannot fill CD-ROMs with words. You have to fill CD-ROMs with images, video, audio, because it has so much capacity for, for bits that words just don't fill it. So that meant that the new content developers wanted to make multimedia CD-ROMs, whether there was an audience for them or not, because people were going to have computers and they were really, really neat things to do, and so that's what they did. And they persuaded a lot of publishers that this would be a good idea, and it was a, it was a terrible, terrible money sink. And all it did was take a lot of experimental money and burn it. But then Amazon happened, and they started in 1995. And the original benefit of Amazon, the reason that, that they became so important so quickly, was we lived in a world where even though there were stores that had 100,000 titles, unless you were looking for a very common book, most stores didn't have it. So you would go to the store that had the biggest selection, but the particular book you wanted often was not there. Amazon showed you every book, and they invented a concept called the promise date, which is this book I can get you in four days, this book I can get you in four weeks. And you make the decision about whether or not you want to order the book. But the promise date was critical because, first of all, it made you confident that it's okay. It, it made, it, the, pro, the promise date made you confident when you placed the order that you would get something that made sense to you, but it also relieved Ingram, I'm sorry, Amazon, 
of what would have been many, many customer service calls with people saying, where is my book? Except that they knew when to expect it. And they set the promise date so that they never exceeded it. Now, the miracle of, Inc of Amazon was that he could start this business with no books because Ingram had a lot of books. And Ingram had a warehouse in Roseville, Oregon, and Jeff Bezos moved to Seattle, Washington from New York, and he set Amazon up in his garage. And so you would go on Amazon, you would order a book, Jeff Bezos would take your money, he would call Ingram, Ingram would get him the book the next day or the day after, he would then ship the book to you. Six weeks later, he had to pay Ingram. So it was cash flow positive on everything that he did, and it was a fantastic business. Right? And that's how he started, and gradually, it, more and more people got, you didn't need any, a CD-ROM drive in your computer, all you needed was to be connected to the internet. More and more people were, more and more people found that this was a, a good way to do business, and he was very tiny, but he was growing very fast, and it was a, a sensible idea. But nobody really knew that except Ingram, because there weren't that many people buying books that way, and it wasn't the biggest, uh, and, the cost, and the publishers didn't really know either, because their Ingram business, they shipped the books to Ingram. They didn't know exactly how many books were going to Amazon, but Ingram knew. And Ingram saw that this could be an enormous business and that they were facilitating it. So they thought, our customers are bookstores. We want to help bookstores. So they went to the bookstores and they said, you don't have to give this business away to Amazon. We'll set you up, give you a web page. We'll give you the, uh, the, the database. We'll ship the book for you with your name on the envelope. We'll set that up for you. And all you have to do is tell your customers, if you want a book, come order it from me online, and you can. And they called that business Ingram Internet Support Services, or I squared, S squared. And they started to announce it with great fanfare, and they put booksellers together to do it, and at that moment, Amazon started to discount the books very, very heavily. And the booksellers looked at this and said, this is crazy. I can't compete with these prices, and there'd be no money in it, and I got a business to run that is a successful business, and who knows about this internet stuff, and I squared S squared became uh, a footnote in 15 minutes. One of the things that's interesting, though, is that I, I'm working now with Ingram on a 50-year history of Ingram. And talking to John Ingram, who's the owner of the company, and who started Lightning, and who started I squared S squared, and who started uh, what they call third-party fulfillment, which is their ability to ship a book with anybody's name on the package. And I said, John, that, that must have been a terrible blow when you got this all organized and then Amazon cut their prices. He said, you know, Mike, I'd even forgotten about that. It was a big victory. I said, why? He said, because third-party fulfillment is one of the critical pillars of our business. And I got our people to get it done on a deadline because we had that I squared S squared business that we wanted to do. So we didn't use it for I squared S squared, but it's still one of the most important things we own. So it was an interesting unintended consequence, but on the other hand, um, it was also a benchmark in Amazon's growth because it was the beginning of their demonstrating the strategy that they weren't trying to make money on books. They were trying to acquire customers with books. And that should have been the signal to everybody in the book business that this is a very unusual competitor because you're trying to make money on something and they're not. So the booksellers in general, suddenly the internet was not of interest. Borders actually just gave Amazon their business. They said, look, they let Amazon run Borders Online temporarily. Barnes & Noble had partnered with Bertelsmann to create Books Online, B-O-L, 
And then they bought Bertelsmann out in the States. So they had barnesandnoble.com. But barnesandnoble.com was a very small junior partner to the stores. So when Amazon started to discount, barnesandnoble.com couldn't discount because all they would do would be to embarrass their store managers and their store clerks with the discounts that were available online. So they didn't want to compete with the stores and they didn't figure out ways to complement them. So they, barnesandnoble.com has lost market share to Amazon every month for 20 years. And the Indies, it was just a profitless distraction. It wasn't something that was worth thinking about at all. But Amazon couldn't be competed with. Um, they, because books were a customer acquisition tool, because they were looking beyond books to a bigger business of retailing, I would say books are now 5% of Amazon's business. Um, and then they were looking beyond that to cloud computing and all sorts of services businesses. And actually, Amazon invented something. Maybe they didn't invent it. They built something for themselves, and then they sell it to everybody else. So they built a marketplace for themselves, then they made the marketplace available to everybody else. They built Kindle for themselves, but then they enabled self-publishing for everybody else. Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post three years ago. The first thing he did was to create a new content management system for the Washington Post. Because he walked in and said, this place is not computer literate. This is crazy. We have to have our people working more effectively. There are now 10 newspapers in the United States that have licensed the Washington Post content management system for their own use. It is the Amazon model all over again. He created it because he needed it. He knew other people needed it. And then he sold what he created for his own efficiency to other people. So, um, at the time, I was making my living by explaining to people that multimedia was a, was, a, was a money sink. And that what really people wanted to read books. And it's what they already understood. And it really didn't matter to some people whether the words were on paper or whether they were on a screen. And in those days, not only was it cheaper to create the text digitally than it was to create video or audio and so forth, it was much simpler to deliver it. And it brought, you didn't need broadband to send an ebook in text to somebody the way you did for pictures or video. Um, you could just deliver text in a simple way. And handheld personal digital assistants, the most famous and ubiquitous being the Palm Pilot, were then becoming ubiquitous, they were becoming common. I started reading books on a Palm Pilot in 1999. Um, in the beginning, I couldn't get many of the books I wanted, so I read both Palm and print because sort of, you had to do that. Um, but I developed the, lo the love of having all my books in my pocket and from the Palm Pilot. So there were three formats that developed. Palm, Microsoft Reader, which was Microsoft's format for personal digital assistants they were creating, and then somebody created Mobi. And the idea for Mobi is it would work either with Palm or Microsoft. So if you sold Mobi, you could sell to everybody. Publishers, in the beginning, were, were completely setting the terms, obviously. So ebooks make them the same price as the print book. Discounts make them the same as the, as the print book. But the, from the bookseller's point of view, which really meant Amazon, there was no inventory, it, well, actually it meant Palm in those days, Palm and Microsoft. There was no inventory investment required. You didn't have to put books on the shelf and hope people would come. You just show it. And then there were no returns. So with full margins, this yielded a big profit on each sale. But the problem was you had to build out an infrastructure of a web page and a delivery and so forth. So they were not inclined to give away the margin. So it worked. The publishers sold the ebooks. At, the book was $25, the ebook was $25. 
Not very many people bought them. They didn't expect many people to buy them. And those they sold were a very good profit for them and a very good profit for the store. Palm became the leading format because there were more Palm Pilots than there were anything else. But they did not, but Palm's model was not, they didn't care about selling ebooks. They cared about owning the Palm customer. So they were perfectly happy to control all the ebook sales of Palm Pilots. No other retailer was allowed to sell Palm digital ebooks. But Moby could deliver to Palm or Microsoft Reader. So Amazon bought Moby and took them off the market and killed the idea that bookstores would have anything to do with this at all. The only format that was working was Palm. The only people that sold Palm was Palm. So the business was stuck in that place. Now, it was fine for me because I owned a Palm Pilot. It worked okay, but it was very limited. It was like, it was like CD-ROMs. I'm sorry, it was like the... Uh, the, the Voyager expanded book 10 years before. The number of people who could use it was very limited. So at the beginning of the 2000s, Amazon's growing its retail share while BarnesandNoble.com is, is sinking. There's a beginning of a slow slide of bookstores because Amazon is growing. Every dollar of sales that Amazon gets it's probably not a dollar lost in bookstores, but it's probably 75 cents lost in bookstores, and that was growing. So sales in the bookstores were beginning to slip. Um, Ebooks were a tiny market, and Sony decided there's an opportunity here, and they introduced a device called a Sony Reader, and they decided they would, like Palm, they would sell readers that were not multifunction, but for books, and they would sell the books. That was their model. But it didn't work. And the ebook market remained tiny. But then in 2007, having kept Moby off the market now for six years, Amazon decided to use their technology and create the Kindle. So in November 2007, they created the Kindle, but Amazon had certain advantages. They were by that time a significant customer for all publishers. And they had good relationships with them because, uh, I like to say this about Amazon, Amazon is every publisher's most profitable customer. They make no returns and they sell a lot of books. It is not Amazon's objective to be every publisher's most profitable customer. They would like to take some of that profit back, please, but that's what they are. And every publisher respects that. So when they went to the publishers and they said, we're going to do ebooks now, and we need more titles. You guys aren't doing enough titles, because most publishers, why bother? They weren't selling any. But we need you to do more titles, and in fact, we'll subsidize the digitization for you, but we need you to commit. And the publishers did. That was a big breakthrough. Second big breakthrough was that the Kindle was the first device that connected directly to the internet so that the content did not have to go through a computer first. You didn't have to sync it. You simply got the content. But, in, but this was before Wi-Fi. So they had to have dial-up in the Kindle. And dial-up costs money. So every time somebody used their Kindle to dial up, Amazon paid. Now, that's fine if they're selling you a book. But what if you're downloading a free sample? Heaven forbid, what if you're using this thing to go to the internet, which they theoretically facilitated? So there was a real risk involved that it required a big company that was a real risk taker to do, but they did it, and it worked. And in fact, it started growing very fast. And no surprise, because the device was $400, who bought it? People who bought a lot of books because you're not gonna buy a $400 device to read three books a year. You buy a $400 device because you read three books a week, right? It doesn't make sense otherwise. So they got a small number of customers, but that small number of customers bought a fairly large number of eBooks. And suddenly, 
publishers are seeing these are real numbers. It's not three or six. It's not 10 or 20. It's 100. It's 200. It's 500. It's real numbers. So this woke everybody else up. And oh, I missed one thing before. They discounted the e-books. That's right. The publishers were, had a $25 book. They had a $25 e-book. They would sell it to Amazon for $12.50. Amazon would sell it for $9.99 because they thought that's what it required. And it should have been obvious to the publishers that Amazon was not going to continue to lose $2.50 a copy forever. But they never lost on everything. They, they picked what they did. They made the smart decisions. But they did not get trapped by the publisher pricing. They priced to the market. And that led to the discounting of e-books. And that was sometimes, that became a little worrying because um, Amazon was also selling a lot of print books and a lot of e-books, beginning to be a big customer. So Barnes & Noble suddenly sees this happening and they see that there's a market and we're getting close now to Wi-Fi, so you're not gonna have to build in the, that dial-up. And they, cr they crash program to create the Nook. Kobo started to expand with a slightly different business model, well-financed, also creating readers. Then Apple released the iPhone, and I switched from reading on a Palm Pilot to reading on an iPhone um, in 2008, and they announced the iPad for 2010. So now, there are suddenly, poss it is suddenly possible, even just through Amazon alone, to sell a substantial number of books without any investment in inventory and without any sales force. And this began the era of self-publishing. This is really concerning for publishers in every way because the aggressive ebook pricing is bound to cut into the appeal of the print books. The bookstores are going crazy because these e-books are terribly threatening to their business, um, and they don't see any meaningful way to participate. They certainly can't participate by se selling books at a loss. Um, this is not only worrying about the fledgling author or the, the housewife at home who writes romance novels, but what if real authors with brand names suddenly decided they would rather have a bigger share of the pie and stud, started to avoid the publishers? Because Kindle's share was starting to get substantial. So this is something that called for some kind of response from the publishers. And the iPad, and, the, and now we're within the last 10 years now, the iPad looked like the solution because Apple did not want to be Amazon. Apple is a hardware company. And they saw the benefit for them selling more iPads and more iPhones if they could sell iBooks. But they didn't want to get into figuring out that we're going to discount this one and we're not going to discount that one and how much margin should we make on this or that. They wanted a simple system. And so they invented the concept, uh, developed the concept for books called agency. And what agency said is, Apple's not selling you the book, Penguin is selling you the book. Apple is an agent for Penguin. The price is set by Penguin, and Penguin pays Apple a percentage of that price as an agency fee. And instead of 50%, which used to be the discount, the agency fee would be 30%. But the price cannot be $25. The price has to be some price lower than the print price. And Apple established bands. Books that cost this much would be $9.99. Books that cost this much would be $12.99. And it was a simple, straightforward formula. And they cooked this up talking to the publishers because they said from the beginning, if we don't get four of the big six, we're not doing this. Because it doesn't make any sense to open a bookstore if we don't have real bestsellers. So the publishers start to think about what do they want to do this. And under all the pressure they were under, they thought this is great. Apple will be our savior. We'll switch from wholesale to agency. We'll stop all this discounting craziness. And um, we'll, do, we'll just do this ourselves. 
When Random House had the meeting in January for the April um, iBookstore opening, their current COO, Nimar Malav Nihar Malavaya, who is one of the smartest guys in the business, said, do we have to make this decision today? And everybody said, no. He said, let's, post, let's wait and see. So we get to the end of March, and the iBookstore is about to open, and the other five of the big six have all gone in. So how big is the iBookstore going to be? Well, I don't know. How fast do you... iPads are just going on sale April 1st. How many can they sell in the month of April, the month of May, the month of June? It's going to be a while before this iBookstore is significant, isn't it? Yeah. So why don't we just not do this now? And we'll continue to be wholesale. And we'll continue to sell our book, our $25 book for $12.50. And we'll continue to let Amazon discount our books. And they became Amazon's favorite publisher. And for the next, I've never seen the numbers, and there's no reason why they ever have to reveal them, but I suspect that the next eight months of 2010 were the most profitable months in the history of Random House. They were not only selling ebooks like crazy because they weren't trapped by agency and because Amazon was discounting their books to make them cheaper than the agency books. They were also selling, Amazon was helping them with print books. Amazon was their best friend. So this was, um, and Amazon, just to make it a little nicer for them, only allowed the other big six to do agency. They wouldn't let Wiley do it. They wouldn't let Norton do it. They wouldn't let Cambridge University Press do it. Those guys, if you want to sell to Apple and you have to do agency, that's your business. With us, it's wholesale, 50% discount. You set the price wherever you want. We'll set the price to the consumer wherever we want. And um, that forced all the other publishers into an extremely inefficient position and just made their lives miserable. But the Department of Justice was about to make the lives of the ones that went into agency miserable. And so a second benefit that Random House got was that while the Department of Justice sued five publishers for collusion with Apple for setting prices, Random House had sat it out for a year, right? So they were not part of this, and they were selling wholesale, and they were not colluding with anybody, so they were not named in the suit. At the time, it's a, it's, a, it's a sign of the way conventional wisdom is so unquestioned. But, every, but so many people, you know, the, the agents were all tr supporting the big publishers who were trying to protect themselves from all this discounting and cheapening of the books and so forth. And everybody supported this idea. And they would say, what's wrong with Random House? And I wrote a blog post, which is one of the ones I'm most proud of, back in 2010, called What is So Hard to Understand About Random House's Strategy? All they're doing is making more money by not following the crowd and being able to do things the way that they want to do things. And so the publishers um, were continuing to lose share to lower cost alternatives. The lower cost alternatives were everybody but them because Amazon could discount everybody else. And now the independent authors, which are beginning to grow in numbers, and they're selling their books for 99 cents, and who knows what is what, and some of them, those books are very good. So the big winner number one was Amazon, because Amazon was the budding monopoly, and everybody else got sued. Big winner number two was Random House. Random House is now, they bought Penguin, they are half the commercial book business. They are bigger than the other four of the big five combined. They were the second big winner. And the third big winner was Ingram, because Ingram was the way to get to everybody else. So all the independent authors and, and independent publishing that took place, Amazon took care of part of your business. You want the rest of the business? You go to Ingram. Totally independently of making this list, and I had forgotten about it, somebody asked me about the future of the book business. And I said, you know, there's only three companies that I would bet for sure will be here 10 years from now. 
Amazon, Penguin Random House, and Ingram. HarperCollins, maybe. Everybody else is subject to consolidation. Every other bookstore, every other wholesaler, every other publisher, I would not bet even money that they'll be here in 10 years. These three, I would. And it's not a coincidence that the Department of Justice did this. Now, I have to say, um, I'm a liberal Democrat. I'm an Obama fan. I, this was a terrible, terrible thing they did. And it was because they did not understand the business. And this is the danger. I mean, this, conservatives tell us about this all the time. And I dismiss it a good deal of the time because the government needs to protect the people from what the corporations do. But this was a case where they made a terrible error and they strengthened the strongest players and weakened everybody else. So the settlement that the publishers had to make with the Department of Justice required that they allow Amazon to discount from the agency price. They could not force Amazon and, and to an extent, not totally, they couldn't sell, they couldn't lose money on the publisher's books, but they could discount as long as they weren't losing money. But unfortunately for the publishers, the shift had already occurred. The, the lower agency pricing discounts were locked in. They only could get 30%. They couldn't get 50% anymore. Amazon had grown dramatically. They didn't need to discount Hachette's e-books anymore. It was not necessary for them to maintain their market share to do favors for Hachette and HarperCollins. They were mad at Hachette and HarperCollins. Hachette and HarperCollins had tried to stop their business. So, it, so now Amazon is forced, to, I mean, the Department of Justice forces those publishers to allow the discounting, but you know what? They didn't do much of the discounting because they didn't, because they, they recognized, this is something, by the way, that you, you need to think about in this marking. Price, fixed prices is protecting you from Amazon. Fixed prices mean less sales. Because if the bookstores will take less money, they'll sell more books. So fixed prices, the publishers don't seem to realize that fixed prices reduce sales, but they do, okay? And this is something that the publishers in the States have learned through agency. And pricing is probably the biggest factor that is driving the slide of share in the big five ebook sales are slipping as a percentage of the total. And it's probably because their ebooks cost too much compared to everybody else's ebooks because they set the prices and they're not responsive to the market. And they would rather sell and they want to protect print, which is not crazy, but they want to protect print. So they want, don't want too big a delta between the print and the ebook price. Now, this was all about distribution and ebooks and so forth. But there's another profound change that has taken place over the last 10 years, um, which I realized I should have talked about in an interview I did for you recently, but I didn't. But this is another very important change. Publishers awoke to the fact that they had to move from being B to B marketers to being B to C marketers. They could not simply, it was fine for publishers for years to simply market to the bookstore. The book on the shelf of the store was the marketing to the consumer. But that started to erode. People stop going to stores and they buy online. They're gonna, buy, they're gonna be influenced by what they see online. And that partly is within the bookstore online but it's also, you read about something in the New York Times, and it mentions a book, and you do a click, and you're at Amazon and you're buying that book. So suddenly, so all of a sudden it became important to talk to people directly through their computers. There's a guy called Seth Godin, whom I recommend to anybody as a digital thinker. And Seth, in the 90s, conceived the idea of permission marketing. And what that means is, you allow me to send you emails, then you're allowing me to market to you at zero cost to me. So if you, the more permissions that you get, the more powerful a marketing engine you have. And publishers started to learn to ask for, may I send you an email, right? And they started building up their lists. 
And in 2011, I wrote a piece about um, Tor books, which is the science fiction arm of Macmillan, and I got some numbers for them. And in the previous month, they had sent out 650,000 emails, and 250,000 had been opened, and 50,000 people had taken the action that they asked them to take. Now, I don't know how many emails Tor has today, but it's a lot more than 650,000. I don't know whether their marketing is as efficient, but emails are still basically free. And um, that they are not alone. Random House has millions of names. Um, Harper has millions of names. And they also have marketers that are working Facebook, et cetera. And what, so what's happened in the US is that the sales forces calling on stores are getting smaller because the number of stores is shrinking. And the number of people working in digital marketing is getting larger because the marketing is now sales. It's not just marketing. And that is a profound change that has happened in the last 10 years. And the retailer network was atrophying at the same part of what happened. So Borders died in 2011. There's a lot of talk about the growth of the independent stores in the United States. The growth of the independent stores doesn't come close to matching what Borders lo we lost when we lost Borders in 2011. We lost 400 superstores. And we're getting the stores that are opening up, independent stores, are tiny little stores, not superstores. So we're opening some stores. They're not nearly as big. They're not nearly as powerful. So Borders left in 2011. Barnes & Noble has shrunk its number of stores, not that dramatically, but they've shrunk the amount of space for books in the stores dramatically because the 150,000 titles is no longer a magnet. It used to be because if you wanted an obscure book, you would go to a store with a big selection to look for it. If you want an obscure in the book now, you go online and order it and, w and wait to get it. So the, so the books that were there to bring the people in stopped bringing the people in. And it wasn't a wise investment of space. So now it's better to sell a stuffed animal. It's better to sell um, a toy. It's better to sell something else than the last 75,000 titles that you were selling. So they shrunk the shelf space for books. We don't account for shelf space. Shelf space is not growing. Bookstores are growing. Shelf space is shrinking. So, and today, and I've asked for this, about this, most of the big publishers in the United States say that independent store sales are under 10%. They're still driving, we create catalogs for independent stores, we have sales forces for independent stores. They, they are the tail wagging the dog now. Today, the US market, for the big publishers, it's 20 to 25% ebooks. They are, Ebooks sell, um, uh, and we'll get to this in a minute, they, they sell um, mostly in straight text. They don't work for any, everything. The big publishers mostly do straight text. Um, but for most adult straight text, between Kindle and Amazon, it's half the books. This is not true for the biggest publishers, because the biggest publishers have accounts like Walmart and Target, who are um, mass merchants that the smaller publishers can't get access to very well. So, and they sell the big bestsellers that are put on sale in many locations. So they may be at 40%, not 50. But it's a big number. Amazon is much bigger than Borders and Barnes & Noble combined were when they were at top of the world. Barnes & Noble is now 10 to 20%. The independents are five to eight. And the rest of it is the yarn shop that sells knitting books the craft store that sells craft books, the mass merchants that sell a few books along with other things. But the compensation for the big publishers, and this is, the con this is where Spanish and English have a lot in common, is that we can sell globally. This is not a particularly useful thing for the Danes or the Italians or even the Germans. It is the salvation of English and it is a very, very important component of what can maintain Spanish publishing in the years to come. When you market online, 
you reach people regardless of where they are based on their interest. If you are marketing books online, you are reaching places in the world that you have to make sure your books can get to or you're wasting marketing effort. That's why in the English language world, no big book would ever have a staged release. It will have a simultaneous global release. No big author wants the US publisher doing all kinds of marketing and not have the book available in London or Sydney or Melbourne. It's crazy. So, so all big books have a simultaneous global release. That's not true in Spanish. That's an opportunity that is so far not been harvested. These are the, the things that I think that uh, part of why I think that looking ahead at what we see, you're going to see the bookstores atrophy. You're going to see the growth of ebooks, and you're going to have the opportunity to market globally. But the problem is that there are more headwinds than there are tailwinds. The, the, the one of the reasons that we're able to sell so many ebooks is that there are so many of these. But the problem with these is they're not Kindles. They don't just have books. I can read a book and I'm interrupted by my email, right? I read a, and, and the email is a link from my wife telling me to take a look at a website, so now I'm interrupted by that website. And I can read a movie, and I can watch a movie. And I can, I can see a TV show. As I have YouTube, I have $40 a month for YouTube, I get all the TV shows that I get in my apartment in New York, anytime I want, anywhere in the world. So now, I'm not the book, I'm not isolated in the book the way I was in a printed book, the way I was in a Kindle. Second point, I believe, I can't prove it, I have no evidence, but I believe attention spans are shortening. And I think that's, that is a product of digital content where we're thinking sort of web page lengths now. Um, shortening attention spans are not good for books. Third, Suddenly, images and videos and audio is easier to create than 50,000 words. And it used to be harder to distribute. It's not harder to distribute. It would be easier for me to take a picture of you and put it up on Facebook than it would be to describe the fact that I'm here and put it up on Facebook. That was not the case. 15 or 20 years ago. I didn't have a, not everybody had a camera in their hands. Not everybody had an audio recording device in their hands. So, all, so not only does the device deliver this distracting content, there's more and more of this distracting content. But the other thing that's threatening for all established publishers is you don't need a big organization to be a publisher anymore. You used to have to be able to, in Spain today, you have to call on all the stores. If you can't call on all the stores, you can't distribute your, your product. In the US, you have to make two calls, Amazon and Ingram, that's all. And your product is in full distribution everywhere in the world by uploading two files. It's pr and in print and in the digital form because of print on demand. And Ingram, in fact, has a whole business now where they'll help you print not just on demand, but digital short run. What, what do you need? You need 5,000? We'll put it in. We'll put it in a printing, real printing press for you. 500? We'll put it in digital short run. One at a time. We can do that too. Um, so you don't have to invest in inventory. You don't have to have an organization. Publishers lived on the fact that they would invest in inventory, and they had an organization. The the moat that protected publishers is gone. It, it may not be obvious, but it is gone. In 1993, you couldn't distribute a book without a significant capital investment in inventory. You couldn't distribute a book without a sales organization. And you couldn't distribute a book without a warehousing infrastructure that could render invoices and collect the money. You had to do all those things or you couldn't be in business. And today, Amazon, Amazon will get you so much of the business that there are lots of publishers and authors that just go to Amazon. They don't bother with the rest, even though they could get the rest by going just to Ingram. Ingram has to persuade people that it's worth making a second stop. 
but most do. Gradually, they all will. But it, that's how powerful Amazon is. Fewer and fewer people even know what publisher a book is coming from or whether it's coming from a publisher at all. And professional intermediaries, like the bookstores and the reviewers, where the publishers spend all this time and effort cultivating these relationships, have been replaced by Facebook and by emails from friends and by all sorts of, of, of media that we don't even think of as media. So the professional intermediaries have less power. Now, different books are affected different ways. The ones that have been changed the most are genre fiction. Romance, sci-fi, mysteries, thrillers. The reason for that is that the people who read those books, many of them read numbers per month, not numbers per year or numbers per five years. So that means getting it a little cheaper matters. And it also means that the judgment about quality is not the way a publisher would make it. It's different. It's a very big audience, and people have their own ideas about what works for them. So this has been the area where the ubiquity of self-publishing has been so great that the established publishers are having a very hard time maintaining their business at prices that work for a commercial operation. Illustrated books, they don't work as e-books, right? Because they, they, and, and they, there aren't as many print outlets as there used to be. So the illustrated book publishers have a different set of problems. Discovery is online, so anything that is topical nonfiction, you have to market in a way so that you get to the online discovery. This is a concept that I call verticalization. It makes sense to stay in an area, whether the area is um, uh, politics or uh, politics and government, or whether it's medieval history, or whether it's um, uh, house, housework. Whatever it is, you want to know all the blogs, you want to know all the, the influencers, that, and you want to do the same kinds of books over and over again so that you can use those relationships. How to has been devastated by YouTube, right? So it used to be you'd show somebody how to do a knitting stitch and you'd show them in eight pictures and captions under the picture and it was expensive to do that, right? You have to, you have to do this, take a picture. Do that, take a picture. Arrange it, oh, we need two more. You have to do it again. Video is easy, it's cheap. You can go to YouTube and you can find out how to get any knitting stitch done. There's, a knitting stitch book is pointless now. And that's happened to lots of things in the how-to area of any kind. Cooking, sewing, craft making, anything. Desi designing. The other thing that's changed is that publishers used to be able to work exclusively with the books that, that were current. Now they have to think about everything they've ever done. Because some blogger finds a book of yours from seven years ago and writes about it, and suddenly that's going to be one of the most important books that you have to co co cover. So publishers have to deploy their resources so that they have resources to devote to backlist books where there are opportunities. The inexorable trends for the future, which I think is the end of this, um, commercial publishing will continue to lose share to indies and other media because the indies and other media are not trying to make money and that we have learned from Amazon is the most difficult kind of competitor. The temporary antidote for English and Spanish is that you can expand your global markets and I, it's an emphasis that everyone should have. The smaller languages are going to lose to English and Spanish. It's already happening. It's getting harder for an English language publisher to sell the Swedish and Danish rights because the Swedes and Danes read English and it takes time to translate a book and the Swedish and Danish publisher doesn't want to buy a book that by the next year when they've translated it everybody's already read in English. So this has already become the case and I'm sure that the same thing will be true with Spanish. There will be far more titles in Spanish than there will be in other languages that is going to, and people will start to learn Spanish 
because it's one of the two global languages and you're going to have a similar effect. So publishing in general will become either super global or hyper local. And that's sort of how. Thank you.